Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. So today I'm going to discuss regarding the Brown Sequence Syndrome. Okay, so we are going to divide this Brown Sequence Syndrome into following subheadings or the following objectives. First, let's understand what is Brown Sequence Syndrome. So let's have a brief introduction about the Brown Sequence Syndrome. Let's discuss regarding the causes of the Brown Sequence Syndrome. Uh, let us know which are the major tracts and their functions which are involved in the Brown Sequence Syndrome. Not only knowing the tracts, we should also understand the course of these tracts in the spinal cord in order to understand what is called as the things and symptoms which are going to occur in the Brown Sequence Syndrome, which occur both at the level of the lesion as well as below the level of the lesion. Okay, so now I'm going to give you a brief introduction. Basically, Brown Sequence Syndrome is nothing but it is hemisectioning of the spinal cord. So, what are all the signs and symptoms a person can develop when his or her spinal cord is cut off in one half, in one lateral half of the spinal cord. So, this is the cross section of the spinal cord. I am going to just tell you a brief functional anatomy about the spinal cord. So, the spinal cord is divided, when we, when we take the cross section, the spinal cord we can see is divided into two portions. One is the outer portion which is called as the white matter of the spinal cord. Another one is the inner portion which is called as the gray matter of the spinal cord. Okay. Now this gray matter is further is having three important portions. See you are seeing here one portion. This is called as the dorsal horn of the gray matter. This is called as the lateral horn of the gray matter. And this is called as the ventral horn of the gray matter. So this is the dorsal horn. Okay. Attached to the dorsal horn we are seeing so many nerves coming out. These are nothing but dorsal roots. These are dorsal roots. Okay. And then the dorsal root is also having a ganglion here which is called as a dorsal root ganglion. It's called as the Darchi. Okay. So remember all the information or all the sensory information which is coming to the spinal cord it is entering via the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. And the motor information is leaving via the ventral horn of the spinal cord. Okay. Now, one more thing is it on what basis I am telling this is the ventral part and this is the dorsal part here is that here we can see one fissure. Okay. This fissure, this is called as the anterior median fissure. So, this fissure is present only on the anterior side. That's why this is going to become the ventral horn, this is going to become the dorsal horn and this is going to become the lateral horn. One more thing to remember here is that lateral horn is not present in all the parts of the spinal cord. The lateral horn is present only in the thoracic and the lumbar part of the spinal cord. And this white matter is again divided into a posterior white funiculus. Okay. Then we have the lateral white funiculus and we also have the anterior white funiculus. So what is brown sequence syndrome? It's nothing but a lesion which involves this one half of the spinal cord. This half of the spinal cord is completely damaged. And what are all the signs and symptoms which develop after this hemisectioning of the spinal cord? This is what is called as Brown Sequence Syndrome. So, what are the causes of the Brown Sequence Syndrome? Brown Sequence Syndrome can occur because of the gunshot injuries, okay? It can occur because of the stab wounds. It can occur because of that part of the spinal cord is not having the blood supply. So, it can also occur because of the ischemia, it can also occur because of the infections and some inflammatory disorder. So, these are the, some of the causes of the Brown Sequence Syndrome. Next, let's see what are all the major tracts which are involved and their functions. There are both ascending tracts which are involved in the Brown Sequence Syndrome as well as the descending tracts. So, two important ascending tracts which are involved in the Brown Sequence Syndrome are one is called as dorsal column, one is called as dorsal column and another one is called as the spinothalamic tract. The spinothalamic tract. So one is called as the dorsal column, another one is called as the spinothalamic tract. Now let's see in this cut section of the spinal cord the location of the dorsal column as to where the dorsal column is located. See the dorsal column is located in this part of the spinal cord. What is this part? This is the posterior white funiculus. So both the sides we are going to have the dorsal column. And the dorsal column is again divided into two portions. One is a medial portion which is called as fasciculus gracilis. Another one is a lateral portion which is called as fasciculus cuneatus. 
the fasciculus gracilis is the one which is carrying the sensations from the lower limb and the fasciculus cuneatus is the one which is carrying the sensations from the upper limb. Next we have the spinothalamic tract. The spinothalamic tract is occupying the anterior portion as well as the lateral portion of the spinal cord somewhere here. That is why the spinothalamic tract is also called as antero lateral system it is also called as the antero lateral system okay and the spinothalamic tract is divided into two portions one is called as the lateral spinothalamic tract another one is called as the anterior spinothalamic tract the anterior spinothalamic tract is located somewhere here in the anterior white funiculus and the lateral spinothalamic tract is located somewhere here in the lateral white funiculus okay these are the two important ascending tracts which are involved in hemisectioning of the spinal cord which is also called as the brown sigwood syndrome next i would like to tell you what are all the sensations which are carried by these ascending tracts so first let's see the sensations which are carried by the dorsal column okay dorsal column dorsal column carries the sensation of fine touch it's very important to remember all these things second it carries the sensation of pressure third it carries what is called as a vibration sense fourth it carries the sensation of tactile localization okay tactile localization fifth it also carries the sensation of tactile discrimination sixth it carries the sensation of stereognosis what is called as stereognosis so these are all the important sensations which are carried by the dorsal column fine touch pressure vibration tactile localization tactile discrimination and stereognosis so if the dorsal column is cut off or there is lesion of the dorsal column all these sensations will be lost all these sensations will be lost remember this thing next i will tell you the sensations which are carried by the spinothalamic tract which are carried by the spinothalamic tract so the spinothalamic tract i told you is divided into two portions one is called as the lateral spinothalamic tract and another one is called as the anterior spinothalamic tract the anterior spinothalamic tract carries only one sensation which is called as crude touch whereas the lateral spinothalamic tract is going to carry two sensations one is the very important sensation of pain. Another one is the sensation of temperature. That is the feeling of hot and cold is what is carried by the spinothalamic tract. Okay. One more thing which I missed telling in the dorsal column. Okay. In the dorsal column is that dorsal column also carries the sensation of proprioception. Remember it also carries the sensation of proprioception. Okay. And the proprioception which is carried by the dorsal column is what is called as conscious proprioception. Now there is one more type of proprioception which is carried by the spinocerebellar tract which is called as the unconscious proprioception. Remember these are all the sensations which are carried by these two important ascending tracts. One is called as the dorsal column and one is called as the spinothalamic tract. Now let's see which is that one uh, descending tract which is involved in the hemisection of the spinal cord. The descending tract which is involved in the hemisection of the spinal cord is what is called as a very important corticospinal tract or it is also called as the pyramidal tract. Corticospinal tract or the pyramidal tract. So it's a descending tract and it supplies, it is having a motor supply to the Okay. So these are all the tracts which are involved. Now let's, let's try to trace these tracts in the spinal cord. For that, let me just draw a cross section of the spinal cord, a rough diagram of the cross section of the spinal cord. So this is how the cross section, this is the anterior median fissure and I'm going to draw the gray matter here. Okay, these are the horns. Okay, so this is how it is. And then I will put a imaginary center line. Now, to understand the brown sigmoid syndrome, let us divide this spinal cord into two halves. One is the right side, another one is the left side. So, let's say there is a lesion in the right half of the spinal cord. Let's say there is a lesion in the right half. 
dorsal cord. So first let me trace the dorsal column. So the fibers carrying the sensations which are conveyed by the dorsal column, they are going to enter into the dorsal root of the spinal cord. From there, they go towards the posterior white funiculus and from there, they ascend upwards on the same side. The fibers are going to ascend upwards on the same side. So Now, what is happening? There is a lesion on the right half of the spinal cord. So, there is interruption of the transmission of the impulses on the same side of the spinal cord. So, that means if there is a right-sided hemisection of the spinal cord, what is going to happen? All the sensations, all the sensations which are carried by the right-sided dorsal column are going to be lost, are going to be lost. Okay. There is ipsilateral, ipsilateral means same side. The lesion is on the right side and the loss of sensations is also going to happen on the same side. So, there is ipsilateral loss of dorsal column sensations, dorsal column sensation. Now, let me trace the spinothalamic tract. So, the fibers carrying the spinothalamic tract are also going to enter into the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. Here, they are going to synapse with the second order neuron. And this second order neuron is now going to cross to the opposite side of the spinal cord and it is going to come to lie in the lateral part as well as in the anterior part. Depending upon whether this corticospinal, uh, this spinothalamic tract, whether it is an anterior spinothalamic tract or a lateral spinothalamic tract. So, once the second order neuron has crossed over to the opposite side, now the fibers are going to ascend upwards. So now, where is the lesion? The site of lesion is where? The site of lesion is on the right side. So where do you think there will be loss of the sensation as far as the spinothalamic tract is concerned? Because the spinothalamic tract is crossing over at the level of the spinal cord, it is carrying the sensations from the opposite half of the body. If there is a lesion, if there is a lesion in right half of the spinal cord, all those sensations which are coming from the left side will be lost. So, on the contralateral side, there is loss of pain, there is loss of temperature and there is also loss of crude touch. This is what we are supposed to understand in the brown sequence syndrome. The main thing here is that the dorsal column is ascending on the same side of the spinal cord whereas the spinothalamic tract is entering from the opposite side and it is going to the other side. So whenever there is a lesion on one half of the spinal cord, all the sensations which are carried by the dorsal column on the same side will be lost but all the sensations which are carried by the spinothalamic tract on the opposite side are going to be lost. This is what is going to happen below the level of the lesion or at the level of the lesion. So, let's see what is going to happen at the level of the lesion. For example, let's say this is this lesion is at the level of the cervical vertebra. So, cervical vertebra is basically our C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6 and all that. And the, we know that the brachial plexus is basically formed by all these cervical uh, uh, part of the spinal cord and that is having a predominant supply to the upper limb. So, if let's say this is the cervical and here there is a lesion. So, what are all go is going to happen? All the sensations on the same side are going to be disturbed. All the sensations, why I am telling you that all the sensations on the same side are going to be disturbed? Because the fibers which are carrying the sensations are going to enter at that level. Either it is the fiber which is carrying the sensation of the sensations which are coming from the dorsal column or it is the fibers which are carrying the sensations from the spinothalamic tract. So here you are seeing the spinothalamic tract is entering here and it is crossing over to the opposite side. Not only that, on the same side also, the spinothalamic tract is going to enter and then it is cross over to the opposite side. So this is also gone. So on the same side, there is loss of dorsal column sensation as well as there is loss of spinothalamic tract sensation. This is happening where? This is happening at the level of the lesion, at the level of the lesion. So, at the level of the lesion, 
I am going to have on the same side loss of dorsal column pathway also and I am also going to have loss of the spinothalamic tract sensations. So I am going to lose the sensation of fine touch, pressure, vibration, stereognosis, tactile localization, tactile discrimination, pain, temperature, everything I am going to lose on the same side. What is going to happen on the opposite side? Here you are seeing these fibers are entering from this side and they are crossing over to the opposite side. Even these fibers are also cut off at the site at the site of the lesion. So what is going to happen on the opposite side? Opposite side again there will be loss of pain, temperature and crude touch. Why? Because of the destruction of the spinothalamic tract which had entered on one side and it is moving on to the other side. So I hope I am clear. On the same side on the same side at the level of the lesion there will be loss of sensations which are carried by both the dorsal column as well as the spinothalamic tract but on the opposite side there is going to be loss of only the sensations which are carried by the spinothalamic tract but that is not going to happen below the level of the lesion i have already explained what is going to happen below the level of the lesion below the level of the lesion as you are seeing here there will be loss of sensations which are carried by the dorsal column on the same side and there is loss of sensations which are carried by the spinothalamic tract on the opposite this is with relation to the ascending pathways now let's see what is going to happen with the corticospinal tract again i am going to draw a rough diagram of the spinal cord here this anterior fissure okay then let me draw the gray matter. Okay, this is the gray matter, let's say. And then let's say this is the cortex. This is the cortex. Corticospinal tract is a tract which is arising from the cortex and coming down to the spinal cord. So this is the right side and then this is the left side. And this is the center line. So the tract is arising from the cortex on this side as well as onto the this side and then what is going to happen these tracts are going to decussate. This level of decussation is where the level of decussation is in the medulla oblongata at the level of the pyramids the level of the lower part of the medulla oblongata. So the 80 percentage of the fibers of the corticospinal tract they are going to cross over at the level of the medulla and after that they are going to descend down and they come to lie here in the lateral part of the white matter and these are called as the lateral corticospinal tracts lateral corticospinal tracts and from there they enter into the ventral gray matter and there they synapse with the lower motor neuron lesion okay there is going to be a synapse and the lower motor neuron is going to supply to the muscle Okay. Similarly, onto the this side, they are going to come onto the lateral uh, part of the white matter and then they enter into the ventral gray horn of the spinal cord and they are going to synapse with the lower motor neuron and the lower motor neuron is nothing but the alpha motor neuron which is going to supply to the muscle. So, where was the lesion? The lesion was where? So, let's say this is the right side and this is the left side. The lesion was here. The lesion was here. There is a lesion here that means the corticospinal tract is damaged. But what will be the features which we are going to see below the level of the lesion? Remember, the corticospinal tract is also called as upper motor neuron. And from the origin of the alpha motor neuron, it is going to give me a lower motor neuron. This is going to give me a lower motor neuron. So, when there is a lesion here, I am going to get on the same side below the level of the lesion, I am going to get an upper motor neuron type of paralysis. An upper motor neuron type of paralysis. But at the level of the lesion, what I am going to get? I am going to get a lower motor neuron because what is happening at the level of the lesion? At the level of the lesion, only damage is to the alpha motor neurons, not to the upper neurons. The damage is at the level of the spinal cord and the gray horn of the spinal cord contains this 
alpha motor neurons that's why alpha motor neurons are damaged at the level of the lesion let's say as i have given you an example let's say there is a lesion in one half of the cervical part of the spinal cord which is going to supply the upper limb okay now what is going to happen at the level of the lesion in the upper limb i am going to get a lower motor neuron type of paralysis but in the lower limb which is below the level of the lesion i am going to get an upper motor neuron type paralysis so that means below the level of the lesion all the features of upper motor neuron paralysis are seen so what are these features these features are one is called as exaggerated deep tendon reflexes very important we are also going to get babinski sign positive which is an extensor plantar reflex and we are going to get paralysis we are going to get what is called as spastic paralysis. In opposite to that, what is going to happen in the lower motor neuron reflex? In the lower motor neuron reflex, all the deep tendon reflexes are lost. Then what we are going to get? And we are going to get a flaccid paralysis and Babinski sign is not positive. Babinski sign is not positive. Along with this, we can also get atrophy of the muscles. Atrophy of the muscles. So, that means below the level of the lesion on the same side, there is loss of dorsal column. So, all the sensations which are carried by the dorsal column on the same side are lost and there is no injury to the spinothalamic tract and then we are going to get an upper motor neuron type of paralysis. Now, what is going to happen on the opposite side to the sensory defect? The sensory defect is related to the spinothalamic tract. So, the sensations of pain, temperature and crude touch is what is lost on the opposite side. There is no injury to the dorsal column and there is no injury to the motor part. What is going to happen at the level of the lesion on the same side, sensory defect, all the sensations are going to be lost. Whether the sensations are carried by the dorsal column or whether the sensation are carried by the spinothalamic tract because all the sensations are going to enter at that level of the lesion. And what will be the motor, motor injury? The motor injury is the lower motor neuron. Why? Why? Because there is damage to the alpha motor neurons which are part of the lower motor neuron. What is going to happen on the opposite side? Opposite side what is going to happen? Only there is loss of pain, temperature and touch and there is no motor loss. So understanding this is extremely, extremely important. So in order to summarize the, the entire brown sequence syndrome, first of all we learned that the brown sequence syndrome is nothing but it is hemisection of the spinal cord section that is one half of the spinal cord is injured what is going to happen okay second thing is we understood few of the causes of the hemisectioning of the spinal cord third thing we saw which are the major tracts which are involved in the hemisectioning of the spinal cord what are these tracts we have ascending and descending in the ascending we basically have the dorsal column and we also have the spinothalamic tract and in the descending we have only one tract which is the corticospinal tract okay then we saw the course of these tracts okay what was very important to notice here in the course was that the dorsal column is ascending on the same side. Dorsal column is ascending onto the same side. So we say ipsilateral loss of sensations which are carried by the dorsal column. But what about the spinothalamic tract? Spinothalamic tract is crossing over to the opposite side. So whenever there is a lesion of the spinothalamic tract on the right side, what we are going to get? We are going to get contralateral loss of sensations like pain, temperature as well as crude touch. This is what we are going to get. Okay, so this is the course and then after understanding what are all the tracts, what are all the sensations which are carried by the tracts and how these tracts are behaving themselves in the spinal cord, we could easily make out what is the thing which is happening at the level of the lesion as well as below the level of the lesion. Okay, so with this, 
I finished this topic of Brown Sequard syndrome. I hope I was able to make you understand the Brown Sequard syndrome in a simple way. If you have really liked and understood this video, just share this video as much as possible and subscribe to my channel. If you are having any doubts regarding the Brown Sequard syndrome, you can leave the doubts in the comment section. Thank you.